Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus. And I am Phyllis Zimbler-Miller. At our podcast, we have often talked to people about the dramatic rise in anti-Semitism on American college campuses. Our guest of today had the opportunity on February 29, 2024, to testify before the United States Congress about her experiences. Yasmin Ohepsion is a graduate of Beverly Hills High School and a student at Tulane University, where she is the co-president of the movement to address anti-Semitism. She also re recently spoke at Shabbat services at Temple Sinai in Los Angeles. Yasmin, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And I really appreciate you highlighting the issue of you know, the current campus climate and how difficult that it's been um, for Jewish students, especially since October 7th. So thank you again for having me. I'm super excited. Thank you. And so are we. And, and you know, the, the situation and the harassments of Jew and the unsafety for Jewish students on campuses, on, Ameri on American campuses for Jewish students, it's, it's on top of, I think, many, many Jewish people's minds. Um, Yasmin, could you first share with us what, what, what you and other Jewish students have been experiencing at Tulane University in New Orleans? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I can start by telling you a little bit about me, if you don't mind, just to give some context. Sure. Um, I'm a senior at Tulane University. I'm majoring in finance, double minoring in marketing and real estate. I sit on the board of Tulane Chabad. I also sit on Tulane's EDI Student Feedback Committee, which is a committee that was put together by Tulane's Chief Diversity Officer, who oversees its EDI initiatives. Um, what is EDI? It's so at Tulane. What does it stand for? What does it stand for? It's typically DEI, which oh, is DEI. diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. Um, but at Tulane, there has been a purposeful rearrangement of those letters in order for equity to be prioritized over diversity and inclusion. So know that if I say EDI, I'm referencing DEI as well. Uh, and those two terms should be synonymous. Um, so I also sit, I'm one of two students that sit on um, Tulane's anti-Semitism working group where we convene with about 16 other um, administrators with regards to the recent rise in anti-Semitism. And I was only invited to join that group after I testified to Congress about these issues, of course. Uh, and finally, I sit on um, Tulane Chabad student board as well, which I've been a member of for the last I have three. a quick question. When did you, when did the EDI uh, ex uh committee start meeting before or after October 7th? So I actually started with two other students, a movement to address anti-Semitism at Tulane in January of 2023. The EDI student feedback committee started after October 7th in November. Um, but, you know, in January of 2023, I got together with these two other students and we started the movement keenly focused on urging Tulane's administration to incorporate anti-Semitism uh, and Jewish students in general in its DEI efforts or EDI, if you will, um, in a mandatory fashion. And so that's kind of how my involvement in this space began. Of course, I would say that Tulane was a much, much safer place for Jewish students before October 7th. We have a large Jewish student population of about 20%. Um, and after October 7th, to finally get back to your question, Evelyn, um, things got really, really difficult for Jewish students on campus. I personally have been verbally harassed. I've been threatened and intimidated online uh, by peers and, you know, non-students, but members of the New Orleans area as well. Um, there was, you know, physical assaults of Jewish students on October 26th, which is about the worst that it got. And thankfully, things have not reached that point again. However, students are being threatened and intimidated on a daily basis. Students are being harassed both on and off campus. 
um, the student organization that is responsible for a lot of the protesting and pro-Palestine activity on campus that's occurring on more of a large scale is a group called Students for a Democratic Society. Um, students that are a member of that members of that group, excuse me, have interrupted several book fest sessions, which is a big um a big event in New Orleans and a big event at Tulane. There also was a big energy summit in New Orleans where every single event was interrupted by a pro-Palestine um, supporter or anti-Israel supporter, whatever you want to call it. Um, and those people were essentially screaming at the top of their lungs in the middle of these events. Uh, and there, you know, there are a lot of examples of things like this happening, but students are also being targeted in a very personal way, whether that be students students being forced to take down Israeli flags in the dorms while other students are allowed to keep their Palestine flags up, whether that be students receiving death threats. A colleague of mine was told outside the law school that, quote, I will kill you slowly because you're Jewish. So these are real, you know, things that are going on on our campuses. These are not just, um, you know, exaggerations. These are not just events that you know you're seeing once or twice in the news maybe the last time that Tulane was in the news could have been on October 26th when there were when there was violence on campus but even when there's not a giant rally with hundreds and hundreds of students even when there's not you know incidents of students being punched in the face or whipped with belts or beaten to the face with megaphones to the point of hospitalization there are situations on campus every single day where students are being targeted for being Jude Jewish, where students are being harassed for being Jewish, where students feel like they can't say the word Israel in their final paper, for example, because they think that they'll fail the course. Um, and so overall, as a Jewish student, I personally feel very unsafe on campus. Um, and I know that many of my peers feel exactly the same way. So where's the administration in all this? I ask myself the same question. And now as a student that sits on two administrative committees. This is I, university administration, Phil, as you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, I, I want to first expose the good, which is that I met with President Fitz and Provost Foreman of Tulane University in December of 2023. And this was after some, you know, pretty intense pressure um, from Jewish donors and board members, as well as trustees, trying to urge the president to meet with my partner, Zoe Silverberg and I. Uh, we finally met with the president on December 8th, which was the first night of Hanukkah. And I desperately, desperately prayed for a Hanukkah miracle. We brought with us what I like to call our bulletproof document, which was a three-pronged proposal to address anti-Semitism. The first part of that was to collect data about what's actually going on on campus, which is not something that the university is currently doing. Um, B, to convene a task force that includes students. And I'm happy to say that there's an anti-Semitism working group that now exists. I'm on it. And this morning was the first meeting that I was invited to. So I can't really attest to the effectiveness of the group other than to say that I've not really seen anything come out of the group at all uh, up until this point. And this morning's meeting was pretty unproductive, if you ask me. There were no big decisions made. Can we just point out, I'm going to look at my calendar, that today is April 15th. So since you had that meeting in, right, in December, December. this is now the first meeting, April 15th, 2024. Okay, keep going. Yes. And... The third prong of our proposal was the mandatory, you know, inclusion of, of anti-Semitism education in the university's diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is not such a big ask, considering that the university already has several mandatory educational components that address other minority groups, such as um, BIPOC folks, members of the LGBTQ community, Hispanic students, students with disabilities, veterans, and Jewish students have notoriously been left that programming um, historically. And so after that meeting, I'm really excited to say that the president and provost sent out three days later on December 11th, sent out 
uh, a message to the entire university condemning anti-Semitism and agreeing and committing to a lot of what we had proposed. However, unfortunately, there has been no action on those commitments, and I have not seen any of those commitments implemented. Um, I met with the two heads of the President's Commission on Equity um, and Tulane Values, which is supposedly the commission that is going to carry out all of these commitments. This meeting was about three weeks ago, and those commission heads very clearly told me that they have not even met with each other to discuss this issue, that they're unaware of a lot of the anti-Semitism going on on campus, and that they haven't even decided who is joining the commission to address the issues of anti-Semitism. So this is what people need to hear, that what students are receiving from administrators right now is empty lip service. It's the words we wanna hear, especially the student who testified to Congress that the university is well aware that I'm involved in this issue that I'm working with, you know, the House Committee on Education and the Workforce and plan on also um, working with the Department of Education at some point to aid in this, in the, um, in the Title VI uh, civil rights investigation into Tulane. Um, but really from my point of view, all I'm seeing is empty promises and empty commitments that don't amount to anything. So while I acknowledge that it's really incredible that Tulane's one of the only schools in the country that has actually committed to changing its system and changing its processes on campus in order to help Jewish students um, and hopefully mitigate some of the anti-Semitism going on. It's not just a word from the president that will change things. It is people in the administration mobilizing towards the goal of actually making things on campus better for Jewish students. And unfortunately, I have just simply not seen that happen yet. So and, and that's, very, that's very important to hear. And what, what is keeping, you think, the, the administra administrators from really taking action? Do they not do they not want it? Do they not not know how to how to do it? Do they not uh, ha have enough um, how do you say incentives to do it? What, what what do you think is leading to this inertia? So, you know, the first thing, and I think it's kind of the elephant in the room here, is the fact of the matter is that. Administrators who oversee diversity, equity, and inclusion programming tend to subscribe to a lot of the anti-Israel and anti-Jewish tropes that, you know, people are, are really currently falling victim to, um, tropes of Jewish privilege, of Jewish power, um, this idea that there are a, people who are oppressed and people who are oppressors, and oppressors are white people of privilege and that the American Jew is somehow categorized in this, in, you know, in this category of a white privileged American individual. Uh, I think it's ironic that administrators have actually told me themselves that they believe these things, considering that I'm a first generation Iranian American and am in no way a white person. Um, so, I think that that categorization of Jews as as oppressors has really made it hard for us to break into this DEI space. I will say that, you know, nationally, most universities in this country have mandatory diversity, equity, and inclusion programming. And unfortunately, Jewish students are notoriously left out of that across the board. This is not something that's unique to Tulane University. And the lack of response on the administration's part is not unique to Tulane University. And in fact, Tulane has, you know, done more than some other schools by just saying that they condemn anti-Semitism, which in my mind is the bare minimum, considering that these universities have quite literally become like, I mean, I don't even know how to say it. They've they've literally become breeding grounds of anti-Semitism. Um, and just, I mean, it's the hatred is constant. The hostility is constant. The protesting is constant. Um, and so I think that that's a big part of the problem. But another 
I think, deeper thought that I've had after working with these administrations for, or my administration at least, for 15 months now is that we asked and pleaded and begged to be included in this programming for months before October 7th. And we were continuously told that these administrators had not seen anti-Semitism on campus, that they didn't think that um, you know, the inclusion of Jewish students in this programming was necessary based on the way that things on campus looked. And so our last resort was to reach out to the influential Jewish people at our universities, um, the people who donate money and have board seats and really have a say so. Uh, and it was only when, you know, they reached out to the president that he actually met with us and he actually began to pay attention to you know, what we're asking for. And I I want to clarify something. Is there a Title VI lawsuit against Tulane right now? Has yeah. there been one? And when Title was it six filed? Meaning, meaning what, Phyllis? It, it's, um, I'll let Yasmin explain, but I just wanted to know if someone's filed it. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act gives students on campuses the ability to safely identify based on you know, a slew of different parts of their identities. One of them is gender, another is sexual orientation. Uh, and the most important one for Jewish students at this current moment is national origin or shared ancestry, as it's said. Um, so the example I like to give is at the end of the Passover Seder, we say next year in Jerusalem. That physically connects me as a Jewish person to the land of Israel, regardless of the fact that my mother's from Israel, and that I have family members there, but religiously, I'm actually tied to the land of Israel. So when people on campus say, fuck Israel, or from the river to the sea, or, you know, any of the other things that they've continuously been seen saying on campus and on social media, that creates a really hostile space on campus for Jewish students, but it also strips us of our legal right to identify through shared heritage and national origin. And when universities have a pervasive issue of, of you know, this exact occurrence, not one time, not two times, but a systemic issue where there are a slew of these types of incidents being reported to the university, and they know that this is happening, and they choose not to do or change anything in order to intervene and make things safer for that identity group, the Department of Education opens a lawsuit um, and the result of that lawsuit can potentially, or investigation I should say, can potentially be that the university will lose every penny of its federal funding. The United States is not going to continue funding universities that are perpetrating and purposefully ignoring anti-Semitism on campuses. I think that that needs to be made clear to university administrators and students that these problems should not be going unnoticed the way that they are. And when people say that, oh, the school is doing so much or, oh, you know, they made all of these commitments and it feels like we're really moving in the right direction, to them I say, then why is the university being investigated? You know, um, and so, can I just add something here? Well, this particular Title VI is very important because it goes through the justice system. It can take a long time. So what I still want to know is, doesn't the Tulane University Administration care about the protest and the chaos on campus? That's the part that I get, get past. That's From more immediate. That could be handled immediately with education I, and programming. From what I've seen, I I really can't say that they do. I think that the protest on October 26th was unique because students were physically attacked and physically assaulted, one of which was hospitalized. Um, where was the campus, where were the campus police? The campus police were standing around. Uh, they barely intervened when this happened. A few people were arrested, which was a huge win for us. Um, and I think that that was a really big deal for our community. But I can give an example of an anecdote during that protest. Um, one of the Jewish students that I'm friends with went up to a you know campus police officer. And at that point, the entire entrance to the academic quad was being blocked by anti-Israel protesters. 
So our option was either to do about a 30 minute walk around the entire perimeter of campus to get to the other entrance of the academic quad or to miss class altogether, which is what I ended up doing. Um, and one of my friends walked up to the campus police and said, hey, I really don't feel comfortable um, you know, walking through this crowd, how am I supposed to get to class? And he said, good luck. Um, and I think that that really represents what we're facing here, which is hostility from administrators, hostility from campus police to some effect. All of the people who were, ar were arrested by New Orleans Police Department, not Tulane Police Department. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to target the police or attack the police. I think that the police also need to receive anti-Semitism education. But I think that, quite frankly, a lot of administrators and police officers and other members of the community that are supposed to be protecting us are really afraid to do so because there is this association between the anti-Israel movement and you know, the free Palestine movement, if you will, and all of these other, you know, progressive left-leaning social justice movements that have taken place in the past. For example, the Me Too movement, the BLM movement. And it's really sad because, you know, me and my Jewish friends, we marched with Black Lives, we support the Me Too movement, and we've supported a lot of these other social justice efforts in the past. But the fact of the matter is that we stood with them and now they're not standing with us. And that association is so strong that it's quite literally causing, I think, administrators and police officers to be really fearful um, to intervene in these situations where if you look at the situation objectively, there should be no question about a police officer intervening when a Jewish student is being physically assaulted to the point of hospitalization. Um, and I think that that's, you know, another major point that needs to be discussed is the fact that there is this social association, whether that be on social media or whether that be, you know, within these progressive movements that Jewish people are occupiers and and that Israel is an apartheid state and that what's going on in Gaza is a genocide. All of these ideas are complete falsehoods and the association between those ideas and these progressive social justice movements online is causing, I would say, all of this modern day anti-Semitism on campuses. Um, and it's also causing the other side to not want to engage in dialogue with us. Um, just a few weeks ago on campus, students were tabling to raise money for UNRWA and, uh, you know, other Gaza- Tabling release. means you had a table in, out on the quad and were raising money, right? Absolutely, yes. Um, and so they had to register that with the university and get permission to do that, which they did. Um, and I approached one of those students and just very calmly asked, where is all of your data coming from? You know, they were spewing all of these seemingly pretty unrealistic statistics um, about what was going on in Gaza, the death toll, et cetera. Um, and when I asked that question, my peer proceeded to ignore me and say, what, what, I can't hear you. And then he muttered under his breath, I don't listen to Zionists. Um, and I think that this really, really depicts what's happening on our campuses. These campuses are supposed to be beacons and havens of free speech, of dialogue, of learning from one another, of exchanging ideas and of thoughts. Um, but when my fellow students who I'm in classes with and who I, you know, walk by and see on campus on a daily basis refuse to speak to me because I'm a Zionist, I think that that's when we've gotten so far away from what our institutions are supposed to do and the ways that they're supposed to protect us. And we're now in this place where there's no dialogue, there's no exchange, there's just hateful rhetoric coming from the other side. Before Jewish students were violently attacked on October 26th, we had our arms around each other and we were singing Ose Shalom, while the other, you know, our fellow students on the other side of the street were screaming, fuck Israel. We're screaming, go back to uh, gas the Jews. We want 1948. Um, 
from the river to the sea, Viva la Palestina, and, you know, all of these other genocidal words and phrases. To have a student come up to me and say, you smell, get back in the showers, and to be expected to go to class with that person and engage with that person, um, and then having, you know, my other peers even refusing to speak to me, I don't know how I'm supposed to get the education that I'm paying $70,000 a year for. It's 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 such a disgrace. It sounds as such a fascist atmosphere on campus. It's unbelievable. Um, I would love to ask you more questions about it, but at this point, you mentioned so much pressure on you. How how does this all make you feel? You know, I. I'll start with the positive because I, I always try to look at the positive in situations, um, which is that I've received a lot of support from Jewish students on campus. I've heard from dozens and dozens of Jewish students who have experienced anti-Semitism, students who are considering transferring from Tulane, students who've had to drop out of classes because their professors don't think that Israel has the right to exist. And I could go on and on. Um, but by speaking out, I hope that even just one person will hear me and even one person will get a better understanding of what it is that students are actually dealing with on these campuses today. I will say that I feel scared. Um, I feel worried that at any moment I'll be walking and somebody on campus will scream at me, which has happened several times. Um, a few weeks ago, I made the bold decision to wear a bring them home sweatshirt um, <laughs> to my classes for one day. And, you know, a part of me was just feeling like I wanted to be really loud. Um, and I, I expected people to react in a negative way. But the sheer hatred that I experienced on that day really put things into perspective for me. When a peer of mine came about three inches away from me and pretended to throw up in my face. When people rolled their eyes at me, when people scoffed at me, when somebody came up to me and said, how dare you? And just walked away. Um, and so when I can't even wear a t-shirt that says, you know, bring them home, when I can't even acknowledge the fact that we still have 134 hostages, innocent civilians being held by Hamas in Gaza, and it's been over 180 days of this. Six months. Um, that's when I feel unsafe. That's when I want to go home and miss class. And I've, you know, I've received so much support and love, whether that be messages in dozens of different languages after I testified saying thank you from Jews and non-Jews alike, or whether that be, you know, a student patting me on the back when they see me wearing my dog tag on campus. All of those moments don't go unnoticed for me, but there is a really painful, sharp fear. My mother calls me and tells me not to walk places alone because she's scared. I keep a hat in my backpack because I sometimes just don't want people to see me. I just want to feel invisible sometimes and just go to class and run home and, and not have to interact with people who I know hate me and think that me and my people should be dead. Um, and, and so... I think that people really need to realize and understand that this is not just free speech. Free speech is not freedom to intimidate, harass, and assault students. Free speech is not freedom to disrupt. Free speech is not freedom to make people feel physically and mentally unsafe. And when people pretend to throw up in my face, and when people say, fuck you, Jew, to me on campus, and there's no investigation that follows that, I can't help but feel scared. And neither can my Jewish peers. You think Let's... there is an incentive for the university not to um, not to stop this, not to let's say at least um, um, put put limits into in place that are really enforced. Uh, you said there the police is the campus police is afraid to interfere. Um, you said the DEI administrators administrators are mostly 
uh, pro-Palestinian. But is there more than that? Is there a, a threat from outside or is there a payment from outside? W what's going on there? So your question seems complex and the answer is so incredibly simple. Qatari donations. Okay. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being donated to every single one of these universities. Every single school that is being investigated for a Title VI violation, at least the nine schools that sat on that round table about anti-Semitism at post-secondary institutions has received a donation from Qatar. Got Tulane it. has received over $270 million in these donations. And Harvard, which I would say is so much worse than Tulane, has received one and a half billion dollars from Qatar. So there's no other individual donor that's donating a billion and a half dollars to a university. And this is exactly what they want. They want students to be indoctrinated to support terrorism, to support, um, you know, the Hamas propaganda and and everything, you know, everything that is happening to ostracize and demean Jewish people. Thankfully, this isn't the case at Tulane, but many of my other peers at Cornell, Columbia, Harvard have dealt with multiple BDS resolutions. And for a university administration to pass BDS into law of a university, I will say that there quite literally has to be an external motivator. And until people start to recognize the fact that Qatari money is talking right now and people are choosing not to listen and choosing to ignore that as the reality of what is propelling all of this and causing all of this to happen in the first place, but to continue even when the Department of Education intervenes and even when, you know, a congressional committee meets to discuss these issues and invites students from all over the country to testify. That is when money is talking and money is is talking right now. Um, and I think that students on all of these campuses have to recognize the fact that those donations are really important and something needs to be done about this. Um, and so I would like to mention in that respect, there is a, um, a legislation pending in Congress. It passed the House. Um, it's now waiting for Senate. It's called the Deterrent Act that wants to make much more visible um, unfriendly nations that um, donate large sums of money to our universities in America. Um, maybe for our listeners, something to look into, the Deterrent Act. Um, and now that we, let's move now to actually what happened when the House Committee on Education and Workforce invited this roundtable of Jewish students impacted by anti-Semitism. So tell us a little about that. Absolutely. So somebody who works for the committee reached out to me. We had a few conversations about what had been going on on campus. Um, all nine of the students that were invited, as I mentioned, you know, all come from schools that are being investigated um, for violations of the Title VI Civil Rights Act, which we discussed. Um, and I'm honored to have been included. I'm really happy that I was able to go and testify. I think that our testimony in and of itself really brought light to a lot of the issues. I also think that there's an element of the fact that we're all students and that people all over the country um, and most importantly, members of Congress are hearing directly from us what we have experienced. This is not you know, somebody else talking about an issue. This is the people who experience this issue on a large scale every single day um speaking and so i think it was incredibly important i think that the members of the committee who attended the round table seemed to be pretty receptive to these issues and were very sympathetic when they heard the harrowing testimony that many of you know my peers and i shared um and i think just the fact that congress convened this round table is really important because it shows the country that 
these issues can't get to this point and go unnoticed. Um, and, you know, for, for me and, and my fellow peers on, on, you know, these other campuses that are leading the charge, I think that it was personally kind of cathartic for us to feel like our voices were finally being heard. Most of us have been working very closely with these administrations and have been ignored, um, whether it's, you know, my requests being ignored for over eight months, or whether it's Shabbos Kestenbaum from Harvard emailing the, you know, the Harvard's task force on anti-Semitism over 40 times and never receiving a single response. Um, and so I think that it's really important for these universities to know that the House Committee is investigating them. And also important to know that every single one of those students has continued to work with the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. That was not a one-time conversation. All of these conversations have continued, and these universities are one by one starting to be impacted by separate congressional investigations that are going on. This can is you, something can you, can you should be wary of. Can you give yeah. us an example? Um, so Rutgers, for example, I believe that the House Committee has either just opened or will open an investigation um, into Rutgers. You know, there have been a lot of document requests that have occurred, and I don't know how much detail I can really get into about that. Um, but the overarching messaging here is that now that the roundtable is over, that does not mean that these conversations are over. I can say, um, and you know, this is the first time I've said this to media, but I have continued working with the House Committee. They're very concerned about some of the things that have gone on at Tulane. Um, and I do believe that there will be some further action from the House Committee on Education and the Workforce to come in terms of um, you know, Tulane's lack of response to the commitments that it made that it made in December um, and to the lack of response to the general you know culture and occurrences of anti-semitism on campus on a daily basis um and so yeah I I I just I can't emphasize enough the fact that these universities are not just going to be let off the hook you know these investigations will continue students like myself on campuses across the country will not stop fighting until Jewish students receive the education that we are paying for and that we are entitled to. We have been admitted to these wonderful institutions that we all worked incredibly hard to, you know, make it to. And the fact that we're now being harassed on a daily basis, the fact that my cousin Eden Yadigar at Columbia University is unable to finish her Middle East studies major because the only professors who teach the last course that she needs to take are professors that are vehemently anti-Israel and outwardly support Hamas is not fair. And as students and as, as outspoken Jews, um, these universities should be very, very clear on the fact that this pressure and um, you know this attention in terms of media, in terms of our engagement with federal agencies and other global organizations will, will not stop until we feel safe on campus. It will not stop until the administration rids itself of the double standard that it continues to engage in. You know, the fact that somebody accosted me on campus and literally said, fuck you Jew to me. And I reported that and the administration decided that that doesn't warrant any sort of investigation. And it was only after I testified to Congress about this issue months and months later that I met with an administrator who told me that the university, quote, dropped the ball. So my message to all of these schools is you can't keep selectively dropping the ball without consequence. You can't only be dropping the ball when it comes to Jewish students but be so ready to protect every other minority group on campus. It is their job to do this. My mom always says that she thinks that I should get my tuition money back and that I should be paid by the university because I am quite literally forcing the school to follow through on commitments that it made within itself and that it very much has the obligation to follow through on itself without pressure from donors, students, 
board members, federal agencies, or any other organization or group. And that needs to be made abundantly clear to these university administrators. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. Thank you. I hope that people take the challenge. Evelyn, we, we're coming close to the end of the, of the conversation. Do you have a last question? Or should we just let Yasmin repeat once more her very strong call to action for all of us? Evelyn? So, uh, sorry, my connection is not stable. Please, please go on, Phyllis. Okay. So, Yasmin, okay, tell us what to do. Give us a call to action as individuals, as alumni of, of universities. Uh, we have interviewed uh, the organization whose name at the moment escapes me, in which you can get on your emailing list of your university so you're updated on things that you can help. Campus fairness, right? Is that what I'm thinking of? But what can we do to help you and the other students? So this is a huge issue and it feels very complex. Um, but I think that there are a lot of ways that people, whether they're currently students or alumni or just Jewish community members that want to help can get involved. The first thing is listen to students, you know, whether that be following people on social media, whether that be watching the news and paying attention to what's going on on these campuses. There are often petitions to sign. There are letters to university administrators to sign. Um, so make sure you, you know, you keep up with that. The second thing is that I I kind of see it as like a spectrum. So right now we're at the very bottom. Students are being physically assaulted on campus. Jewish students are not physically safe on campuses. So the first thing we need to do is secure these campuses. If your local Chabad that's connected to a university or Hillel needs enough funding to have a security guard, donate that money. Um, you know, we need security outside of our Jewish spaces on campus and Jewish institutions on a daily and hourly basis. And it's really unfortunate that it's gotten to that point, but it absolutely is at that point. So we need to physically secure our universities to donors and people and alumni of universities or people who are involved in university committees. Every single university, with the exception of a few, have mandatory education that um, with regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Jewish students absolutely need to be included in that education, and 99% of the time they're not. People need to learn about our people. People need to understand our history. And most importantly, students on campuses need to hear what this anti-Semitism looks like and how they can help. So urge all of you know your university administrators that you know or alumni to reach out to these universities and tell them that these offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion and of student conduct are failing if Jewish students are not included in this conversation and in this programming. And finally, when things do happen on campus, people need to be held accountable. So when somebody is violently attacked, people should be arrested. When a student is verbally assaulted um, or, you know, accosted on campus for that matter, the response should not be to label the incident as political. The response should be to investigate the scenario and follow through with disciplinary action. So I guess what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that the way that these university policies and offices protect and help other groups of minority students on campuses, those offices and policies also need to protect Jewish students. And alumni, students, faculty, and other community members of these schools should not stop lobbying for that until they get it. And once these university administrators commit to change, we need to actually see that change through. So listen to the students who are speaking out, listen to what they're asking for, help them in any way that they can, and independently urge your university communities that you are in touch with to protect Jewish students, regardless of the status quo, regardless of what they want to do or what they have been doing. But rather, this is what they need to do because this is the right thing to do. And it's because 
And it it is the right thing to do because dozens and dozens and dozens of students on every single college campus are suffering every single day as a result of this vehement, blatant to hatred. And it needs to stop. And for all of the people who hate us and for all of the people on my campus and elsewhere who don't want to see this change made, you should know that we will not stop until things change and we will not stop until things are safer. Um, and, you know, it's thanks to lovely women like you and so many other people around the world that are talking about this issue, raising their voices and bringing light to the fact that what's happening is so unjust that anything will actually change. So I thank you both immensely for what you're doing. I thank you for having me um, on this wonderful show today. And I really hope that um, the listeners will be inspired to take action, to reach out to the local student leaders that you know, and to do anything you possibly can to help this important, timely cause. Amen. Very, very well said. Thank I you hope so, so much. We thank our listeners and we hope you're not just listening, but you're going to act on her important call to action. For those of you who want to know more about Evelyn or myself for our work, you can go to Never Again Is Now podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And as we end every show, we say, speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.